pray. Father, we sing this song, our declaration, our testimony as the body of Christ. We were in utter darkness. We who were bound by our sin, lost and dying, and yet you came and rescued us by your great love and your great grace. What can we do, Father, except gather like this and give you all of our honor and all of the glory that you deserve? You are King of kings and Lord of lords. We bow before you, God of all creation, because you have done what no one else could have done for us, and we have found a home, and we will never be alone. Lord, for many of us, that is so precious. That comforts us in the midst of the storms and the trials of life. We are reminded this morning that the gospel of Jesus Christ is greater than anything else and anyone else. Jesus, you are better. You are better. We are here Maybe our hearts have been wandering this week and we needed to be reminded that your grace is greater than that thing we are struggling with. Maybe we needed to be reminded, Jesus, that your grace is greater than that suffering that we are enduring. Maybe we need to be reminded of the hope that we have in you, that in Christ, those who live and believe in you will live even though they die, that Jesus, you are the resurrection and the life. Lord, I pray for Barb Taylor, our interim director of the orchestra and her family as they grieve the loss of her mom. I pray for comfort and grace. I thank you for her mom's faith in Jesus and her experiencing glory even now. But I pray, Lord, that you would comfort them in their sorrow and in their grief. Remind them that you are with them. Emmanuel, God with us. God, and I pray for all of our missionaries around the world right now who are ministering the gospel, who are serving, who have given up worldly treasures because they believe Jesus is greater. Remind them of your great love for them, that you are with them. Provide fruitful labor for their efforts, Lord. I pray for the, the Smiths this week in Papua New Guinea. Encourage them, use them mightily. And I thank you, Lord, that we as a church can gather and can give of our finances to further spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we give joyfully, generously, and out of faith. We pray that you would use this time to glorify your name. In Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Amen. Our Lord lives again. As we uh, continue to sing, let me just remind us what the psalmist has said about our great Lord. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And this is where it gets kind of cool because to me, you know, all his benefits. Oh, yeah, I got, I got a house. I got clothes on my back. I got food to eat. No, this is what the psalmist says. He says, Forget not all his benefits, who forgives all our iniquity and heals all our diseases, who redeems us from the pit, who crowns us with steadfast love and mercy. It goes on to say, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And that's just a glorious truth, and I, I hope that's just a reminder as we continue to sing. We're going to sing about the greatness of our God, and then we're going to crown him with majesty. May we just focus on these words of what he has done for us and the benefit in Christ. Not, not an easy life, but the benefit of freedom and salvation and forgiveness and redemption. So uh, would you stand and sing with us?
God who reigns forevermore. Lord, may this be our prayer as we learn more about you, as we read verses, as we, as we read scripture, as we meet with one another. Lord, may uh, your praise and glory be on our tongues because of what you have done, what you're doing in our lives, and what you will conten- continue to do. Lord, we thank you and praise you for who you are. Uh, Lord, you are amazing, and let us never stop saying that. Lord, I ask all these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated.
I hope you've come to a place in your life where you can say what she just sung. Not for a moment will he ever leave us. That is our great promise in Christ. Aren't you glad for the gift of music, by the way? I feel like this morning God has been ministering through the music, and I am grateful. This morning we have the great privilege uh, to have Tuvia Zaretsky, who is on staff with Jews for Jesus, uh, with us to share uh, a special message, Christ in the Feast of the Tabernacle. And uh, we are just delighted to have him. We're, we support him. We've been a supporting church with Tuvia for about 30 years, I think. I think he mentioned dates that were before I was even born. But I'll just say about 30 years uh, we've been supporting him. And uh, I am so glad we have been. I got a chance to meet with uh, Tuvia a few hours yesterday. And it is just a delight to know him and be partners with him in ministry. Tuvia grew up in a traditional uh, Jewish home, grew up going to synagogue. And at just some point in his life, um, started seeking, who, who are you, God? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who are you? And was very surprised at how God revealed himself and through whom he revealed himself, through Jesus, the Messiah. And so uh, we are just thankful for his work. He is the director of uh, staff development and training. So he writes a lot of the materials, does a lot of the training uh, for the, those who are on staff with Jews for Jesus. Spent like six months in Israel last year uh, doing some training and work there. And uh, for me personally, I can just say, as someone who's come from uh, an Egyptian background, so a Middle Eastern man and a Jewish man, uh, to be able to stand with him and say, uh, this is my brother, you know, w we should be at odds. We should be warring. And so it, it's um, a special uh, pleasure for me to introduce to you my brother in Christ, Tuvia Zaretsky. Would you please welcome him? Pastor Mark, Mark, I'm really enjoying getting to know you here, and, and uh, Pastor Brady, thank you for the welcome back. I was just thrilled when uh, um, I was invited back. I was um, uh, coming out to the Evangelical Theological Society up in Baltimore all this past week, and I uh, was listening to all these erudite papers and so on, and wearing a tie, and, and, and uh, when I knew I was coming back here, I was really thrilled. Really glad to see some of the culture change going on. And uh, I, just, I just feel so inspired. I'm going to go for it. I'm just going to do this because I've been dying all week long. And I'm home, okay? <laughs> oh, thank you. Thanks for inviting me to do that. I love seeing the, the life of the Lord here. I love seeing the changes that are happening. But one thing that doesn't change is the commitment to the Word of God and your love for Jesus Christ and the growth of the body. And I'm just thrilled for what's, what's happening. And I want to tell you that I'm honored to be here with you this morning. I'm looking forward to this. This is, this is a wonderful presentation. And you got the perfect Sunday. I love doing this. And the best Sunday to do it is the one just before Thanksgiving. So warm your hands up. We're going to have some fun. I also want you to meet some folks. Um, two colleagues of mine are here from our office in Washington, DC. David and Rachel Liebman. Can you guys stand for a second? Uh, they may, uh, Rachel or David may have to dash out if uh, their son Micah um, acts up in the nursery, but we're good. We're good. You understand how that is. Um, why am I so excited about this? Well, first of all, um, I'm excited at this season to be able to, to have a pause and to give thanks to God for who he is in our midst and what he means to our lives to make us fruitful and to dwell with us. If you're taking notes, those are the two key themes this morning. It is he who dwells with us, and it is that indwelling with us that makes us fruitful. And that's the only way that life can fulfill the destiny for which we were created. And I'll come back to that in a moment. <clears throat> I get uh, um, kind of nostalgic at this part of the year because I, I just I recognize it, that it's uh, one of those times when families come together um, my family, both my parents were um, from um, immigrant families. My father's family came from Belarus. My mom's family came from Austria-Hungary. My dad's 
Grandfather was murdered in a pogrom. That's why they came to Canada, to North America, my mom's family. Those who didn't flee Austria-Hungary died in the Holocaust. And we grew up as, as a minority community. Um, I grew up in California, okay? Don't hold it again. <laughs> uh, my, my folks met and married. My mom was from actually the Holy Land, which you probably know is the Bronx, New York. Settled out in California, and, and we were in the institutions of American Judaism, but we loved to celebrate Thanksgiving because it was so connected to the Jewish festival of, of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. And you'll see how those connect this morning. In fact, <clears throat> there, this year there's a really weird connection. It hasn't happened in more than, what, 250 years? That um, the first day of Hanukkah on the Jewish calendar um, coincides with the what the Jewish community calls the Christian feast of Thanksgiving. And so the Jewish community is all excited. And one guy even went out and did a kind of a facsimile of um, the, uh, uh, what did they call that? You know, here, I'll show you. <laughs> American Gothic, that was it, yeah. yeah. And it, all over the Jewish newspapers, you see this, this um, statement. It's, it's Thanksgivuka. <laughs> I don't know how it's going to work. Oh. Okay, there is, there is behind this festival a biblical basis for us. The early, the early pilgrims that came to this country were, were looking for religious freedom. They were looking for a way to express their faith and to live out their love for God, and, and they were pretty serious people. We know that. After their first year in this land, half of them died. And they were encouraged planting indigenous crops, uh, hunting some of the... the um, Meals that were available here, I'm not talking about fast food stuff, but they were, they were able to, to, and they looked forward to surviving the first, their second winter, and they wanted to give thanks to God. They wanted to give thanks to God, and they looked for where they could, could find it, and they looked in the Bible of all places, and they found the Jewish festival of Sukkot, and they said that was a fall harvest festival. That's a perfect example for us. And so much of our heritage at this time of the year is rooted back in that holiday. And so you'll see why I, I find this wonderful connection between the Jewish festival of Sukkot or tabernacles dating back to the time when my ancestors came out of slavery in the land of Egypt and the experience of its fulfillment in the coming of Jesus, the Messiah. Now, make, make no mistake about something here. I think it's pretty, pretty clear right now. That, you know, if somebody asked you tomorrow, was, was this guy who was talking that, was he Jewish or was he a Christian? The answer is yes, right? We all got that? Good, okay. So the, they look back at that, but um, I'm very reminded at this time of year that, that Thanksgiving is most often for us most joyous in the midst of pain or when the pain stops or in the midst of chaos, when we can say, Lord, I trust you. I trust you. Or when we look at, at uh, situations that cause fear or discouragement, to be able to say, God, I trust you, comes out of the wellspring of thanksgiving and the fullness of joy. It's not just looking at the table and saying, wow, love those mashed potatoes and the yams but to know that God is with us and he makes life meaningful and fruitful. Um, I saw um, an Old Testament uh, professor of mine this last week. He's a wonderful man, Dr. Walter C. Kaiser, Jr. Um, one of the things I learned from him that's kind of stuck with me when we were studying Old Testament theology is a three-part formula that, that shows up in the Bible all the way from beginning to end. God said, I will be your God, you will be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of you from the very beginning to the very end of the Bible, a three-part formula. It started in the Garden of Eden. God is with Adam and Eve, walking in the cool of the day. He is with them. They are his people until the fall, and their relationship was broken. Adam and Eve did not go to a facility 
They didn't go to a, a church to worship God. They didn't go to a synagogue to worship God. They didn't go to a mosque to worship God. They were just people who walked with God and had a relationship with him and loved him and adored him until the fall. And then they loved him out of a broken heart. And God said he would take it upon himself to restore that fellowship. That he would bring the seed of a woman who had crushed the head of the evil one who had tricked them, accomplish their redemption, wipe away the issue of, that had broken their fellowship and their relationship, and restore that wonderful relationship through a seed that would come through a woman. Genesis 3.15. I will be your God, you will be my people, I will dwell in the midst of you. Did you ever think of this? The reason that God took Adam and Eve and took them out of the garden was to protect them. It wasn't a punishment. It was to protect them. He said, I don't want you to go back and eat of the tree of the knowledge of eternal life. Because if you eat of the etchayim, the tree of life, you will live etern eternally in this broken, fallen state. But if I get you out of the garden and then there's time for you to meet the seed of the woman who would redeem you, then we can set the basis on which humanity, at least a remnant of humanity, could know God and walk with him and live with him through eternity. And through all that period of time, he promises, I will be your God, you will be my people, I will dwell in the midst of you. So he needs a, a woman to have the seed, <clears throat> picks a tribe, becomes a nation, a family, and down through the, the years, out of the tribe of Judah comes a family and a woman named Miriam. You know her as Mary. She has a baby, Jesus. Yeshua, we call him in Hebrew. As God is preparing that people for this in uh, Leviticus, we read that they, they came out of slavery, and at the time that they came out of slavery, in Leviticus 26, 12, he says, I will also walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. From the beginning to the end, this message keeps coming out. God wants to be with, with a people. He wants to be with us. He wants us to know him. He wants to make us fruitful again and again and again. The cause of our thanksgiving to God is that in the worst of circumstances, imagine how bad it was for Israel. The Jewish people, having just come out of slavery, all they knew for 400 years, we were slaves. We were nobodies. We had no government, we had no army, we had no agricultural uh, basis and no economy, and yet God says, I will be in the midst of you and make you fruitful. What a message. I commend this to you as a theme for Thursday night, all day Thursday. Every day, why not? <laughs> well, the Jewish people had to learn about these, uh, um, uh, this walk and this life with God. And so God embeds in our calendar a series of festivals. There were seven of them all together. All seven of those feasts were intended to teach us and train us how to walk with God. <clears throat> They're broken up into three units. Um, each one of those three units was a pilgrimage festival, so everybody has to go up to the city of Jerusalem. At the beginning of the year, there's a, the spring festivals, we remember God as a redeemer. We come back 50 days later and we celebrate the Feast of uh, you call it Pentecost, Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. We remember that God is going to bring about a great harvest. It's just a beginning. We can look to him to make our lives fruitful, our, our land fruitful, and he'll be with us. And then we come back in the fall, and we celebrate these three festivals in the fall. And it's the season that we would be in now. Now, it happens a little bit earlier because uh, the Jewish calendar is a calendar from the Middle East. It is a, an Asian calendar. Uh, Israel is located in the continent of Asia. And so we are um, tied to a lunar calendar that was part of our heritage. And so at, as this uh, festival of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, was approaching, um, we're going to read about what it, what it said and what it did in just a moment. But as it was approaching, um, God wants to make sure everybody knows it's time to go to Jerusalem. It's the pilgrimage festival. And so the high priest would stand at the corner of the, the temple and blow a trumpet. And the trumpet would call everybody to wake up and get ready to go to Jerusalem. It was an alarm clock, big horn blown from the Temple Mount. Ra the sound radiates across the, the hills and the villages all around hear it, and they blow their trumpets. And so from village to village, the trumpets were blown. It was the old internet, okay? <laughs> way back. And that's how they communicated all the way out into the, the diaspora. And so Jewish people would be uh, preparing to go up to the city of Jerusalem. They would be um, collecting some animals. They would be gathering fruits and vegetables from the land. They would be looking forward to seeing all their friends up in the city of Jerusalem for um, a two, uh, an eight-day festival. And uh, they'd pack up their belongings, and as small units from their villages, they would start up to the city of Jerusalem. Two weeks to get there. 
They're going up to God's house. Now imagine you're going to go up to God's house. You've got an offering to bring, and you're on your way up. <clears throat> and you look at your clothes, and you look at what you're bringing, and you're going, what if it's not enough? What if it's not good enough? What if I'm not good? What if God sees what's going on in my heart? What if he, he notices that I mean, I'm not, just not sanctified enough? I'm not holy enough. I'm not even close to perfect. How am I going to go into God's house and be there with him? I'm going to see the Shekinah glory glowing over the holy of holies. How am I going to be there? And God said to the people, I got your back covered. That's my translation. Sorry. It's okay. You can come to the city because five days before the feast, God takes it on himself to prepare a sacrifice. He says, just bring a sacrifice, a particular sacrifice, an asham offering, offered once a year on the altar with blood poured out, first for the priest and for all the people. And the blood sacrifice was to cover and cleanse all the sin for all the people for the entire year. Come on up to my house. I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. And I want to dwell in the midst of you, says the Lord. Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, the day on which one atonement was made, a sacrifice that had to be offered every single year until a permanent sacrifice came in. And that permanent sacrifice has been obvious to all who believe. It is the Messiah Yeshua, the Messiah Jesus, who fulfilled that whole picture. So five days later, we presented ourselves in the city of Jerusalem. <clears throat> it's the time for the festival. And uh, you might as well turn there and read about it. Um, let's go to Leviticus 23, where you've probably been doing your devotions this past week, right? <laughs> in the Torah. And uh, let's just read what it says so we know uh, we can get a handle on this. I'm going to read it up here because my, my version might be different. Um, Say to the Israelites, on the 15th day of the seventh month, the Lord's Feast of Sukkot begins, tabernacles. It lasts for seven days. The first day is to be a sacred assembly. Do no regular work. I'll let you get there. <laughs> it's in the front of the book. It's about... Anyway. For seven days, present off... You know, I love the Old Testament. I actually love the New Testament because it reminds me of the Old Testament so much. Anyway, I do read it. Okay. For seven days, present an offering made to the Lord by fire, and on the eighth day, hold a sacred assembly and present an offering made to the Lord by fire. It is the closing assembly. Do no regular work. Lays it out very simply. It's a seven-day festival with an extra day added on called a Hoshana Rabbah. That's the great day of salvation. It's the culmination of the festival. It's the grand finale. So they're going to present themselves, people would present themselves in the city, <clears throat> It's a Shabbat, a day of rest. No other work is done. You're going to see all of your friends from all over the world gathered back there. Relatives, friends connected with your family. Um, dwell together in the city of Jerusalem. There's going to be um, offerings made, by, made to the Lord by fire. These are sacrifices, goats, um, lamb, oxen, offered on the altar at the temple, divided, given up to people. Smoke billowing out of the temple mount. Meat being distributed, cooked meat. Do no regular work. Um, let's read the rest of this. So beginning with the 15th day of the seventh month. Now, that's, that's important. On a lunar calendar, the 15th day is the full moon. It's the middle of a lunar, lunar month. So the Temple Mount is ablaze with light, first from the moon, and then uh, secondly from, from the candelabrum that have been lit. I'm going to, this is not exactly what they look like. The candelabrum at the, at the temple on the high, 40 foot high walls were not wax and, and um, a wick. They were, they were bowls, actually in the shape of pomegranates, filled with about 40 gallons of olive oil. And um, servants had to go up on top of the, the um, yeah, it looks better down there. Servants, uh, would have to go up on top of the, the walls and light the, the bowls. And they, they were menorot, or seven-branch candelabrums. So it was huge. Just imagine the, the light coming off of these high walls, filling the, the temple mount with light. So you've got this gorgeous lighting at the, in the evening. 
Um, you've got the, the meat that's cooking and the smoke filling the place. What else is happening? After you gather the crops of the land, celebrate to the Lord for seven days. The first day is the day of rest. And again, the eighth day is that great day of rest, the Hoshana Rabbah. So you're bringing um, pomegranates, you're bringing grapes, you're bringing the, the fruits and vegetables from the land and your fields. You're bringing um, sheaves of grain and bringing that up and offering it. You know, if you've, if you've um, come from nearby, maybe the Galilee, you're bringing grapes. If you come from the diaspora way over in Iraq, you might be, but your grape, you start with grapes, but they're raisins by the time you get there. It's all good. So they're offering that. Um, and the first day is a day of rest. The eighth day is also a day of rest. On the first day, you're to take, a, take choice fruit from the trees and palm fronds, leafy branches, and poplars. Rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. We have on the table, uh, we still do this, by the way. We set up these little booths around our houses. We have a, um, a lulav, which is the, the palm frond, and uh, the poplar and the myrtle, and, and we wave that as a reminder that God is the one who pours out the rain and makes our land green and fruitful. It's that kind of parallel to God pours out his spirit in our lives, and you'll see how that happens in just a moment, and makes us fruitful. And so the, there's, people actually will wave these to, during the, the celebration, give thanks to God for the rain. You know, in L.A., we have about 12 inches of rain a year. In, uh, in Israel, it's not just that they have about 8 to 10 inches of rain because it's a desert, but where the rain falls. You know, if it doesn't fall on your farm, it doesn't do you any good. So there's a thanksgiving when God pours out the rains, and they, they come in a very short season. And water in ancient Israel was what oil is to many in the Middle East today, is a precious, valuable commodity. By the way, these, these also herald the, the days when the, all is going to be well on the, on the earth and, and um, joy is taking place. Uh, many have said by tradition that the, when the Messiah comes, it will, he will come on Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, because he'll come to dwell with us, and you'll see why we say that in a few minutes. But what happens when Jesus walks into, into Jerusalem or riding, rides into Jerusalem on the, on the donkey? The crowds grab palm fronds and begin to wave them because they're saying, this is the Messiah, this is the season on which he is coming to dwell with us. What joy and excitement. Um, wrong, wrong festival, right action, uh, based on what was happening in, in the Feast of Sukkot and what that meant to the people. So let's see, um, wave those and, and rejoice before the Lord. And let's do the last one, I think, yeah. Celebrate this as a festival to the Lord for seven days each year. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Celebrate it in the seventh month. Live in booths for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in booths. And so we would be, <clears throat> build these. Uh, my family used to do this. It would look something like, like this. Uh, and um, they would be by the house or by our synagogue. A table always is featured inside for ushpizin so that, that if neighbors come over, we can offer hospitality. Ushpezin means hospitality. So you have all this food and, and a wonderful warmth and a gathering in of people to give thanks to God. What a perfect basis to think about Thanksgiving. Huh? Look where it comes from, this joyous festival, uh, a time to, to reflect. So what's happening? Uh, you're coming from all over the land. You're seeing all of your friends. Um, you're bringing fruits, libations, Grain is being cooked into the bread and baked. Um, and um, there's meat being cooked at the temple, which is being distributed. You smell the, the aroma of barbecue? What's happening? What do we call this? It's a big party. It's a big feast. It's a joyous time to ingather and give thanks to God for all his blessings. It doesn't happen just because uh, times are good. This happened season after season in good times and bad. And frankly, um, the, the last time we read in the Bible that it, that it happened in good time was Solomon gets down on his knees in 1 Kings 8 and dedicates the temple. When, we came, when our, my ancestors came into the land and God had given us the land after great struggle, for a lot of people it was very, very controversial, but it was great struggle to be there. It was what God had, had foretold and promised our people. It didn't just happen by the click of a finger like Disneyland. It was a hard time. Solomon gets down on his knees and he says, unlike 
all the other kings of the Middle East, Solomon is under God. All the other kings of the Middle East said they were God. Solomon says he's under God, gets down on his knees, lifts his hands to heaven. He said, Lord, this is your house. You will be our God. We will be your people. We want you to dwell in our midst and make our land and our lives fruitful. And he confessed to the people, we can only do that as we are living before you and obedient to you. Didn't last very long. Barely 400 years later, the temple was destroyed. The Feast of Sukkot was no longer celebrated. But worst of all, the Shekinah glory of God, which had dwelt over that temple, departed. And there was no longer the imprimatur of God's sanction. And in sadness, the nation was carried away into captivity and ultimately came back and began to rebuild the temple and in the city. But there was no Holy Spirit. There was no Shekinah glory. Not until the person of Jesus came back or came and dwelt among us. Now, let me just give you one more time that, that theme associated with this. The sukkah, the tabernacle, the booth is supposed to symbolize for us and I think you can say this, the sukkah was this imagery of God dwelling with us. He'd said that's what he wanted to do. He said, build the booths and come to my house and dwell with me, and I will dwell with you. Emmanuel, God with us. It was the name of my synagogue growing up, Temple Emmanuel in San Jose, California. My parents were actually married in another synagogue named Temple Emmanuel in San Francisco. And yet we didn't know what it was like to live with God because we missed the one key element. And that was the Savior who was to introduce us to him. I cried out to God at that synagogue. I cried out to God at Temple Emmanuel. 13 years old in my bar mitzvah, I said, here am I, God, with the words of the prophet Isaiah, here am I, God, send me. And then they complained afterwards that all my relatives came to the bar mitzvah, but he didn't. He was at the bar mitzvah. I just didn't know him at the time. He met me 10 years later, and against all culture and all tradition, he introduced himself to me in the person of Jesus Christ. And I was shocked. I'm Jewish. Jews don't believe in Jesus. Didn't matter. He's the truth. One of the things that struck me um, about Jesus that I had no, I, I had no idea that where he, who he was and what he was like, um, somebody had recommended that I start reading the Gospel of John. <clears throat> and I was, you know, I'll do that. I figured I would be reading about Johnny Cash and Billy Graham. Mm, what do I know? <laughs> but I get to John chapter 3, and I found out that Jesus celebrated Passover. And I went, are you kidding me? Nobody ever told me that. John chapter 10 is the only place in the entire Bible in the entire Bible, where the Jewish feast of Hanukkah is mentioned. And in John 7, Jesus is going to keep the feast of, of tabernacles. God wants to make us fruitful. He's Emmanuel. Sorry, he wants to live with us. He's Emmanuel, the God who's with us. And he wants to do that because he wants to make us fruitful. Something we cannot do for ourselves because we are broken and fallen, and yet he wants to be our fruitfulness. So Jesus comes to the city of Jerusalem. We read in John 7, verse 2, but when the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near, when Chag Sukkot was karov, <laughs> when the Feast of Tabernacles was near at hand, so we know it's the fall, we know that it's, um, we're, it's probably uh, dark, but moving toward the full moon, and Jesus' disciples have gone up to the city of Jerusalem, and he's on his way after them because the Jewish rulers have been looking for this, pretending, this pretend Messiah, as they called him. Now, not until halfway through the feast did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach in verse 14. So we know it's a seven-day feast with a uh, grand finale tacked on the end. Someplace in the midst of that time, Jesus goes up to the city of Jerusalem. He presents himself at the holy temple, and he begins to teach the people. Before you say, I wish I knew what he taught, John tells us. It is Hoshana Rabbah. It is the last day, the great day of the feast. Jesus stands up. He has something to teach the people. Now, I need to set a picture for you. During this festival, the high priests, high priest and the priests that work with him, 
would go down to the pool of Siloam, which is just down the hill from the Holy Temple, you can still go there today. Archaeologists have found the pool of Siloam at the bottom of the Ophel, the, the hill of the city of David. The mosaic on the floor, probably the one that the blind man in John 9 saw for the first time when he washed the mud off of his eyes had been made by spittle from Jesus. You can see it yourself. The water is still flowing in there from the Gihon Spring through the tunnel the Bible describes as cut by Hezekiah. It's all there. The priests would go down and they would take ewers, large pitchers, much bigger than this, it's just a sample, okay? It's pitchers, fill them with water, bring them up on carts up to the holy temple. There the water would be poured into a silver bowl on the temple courtyard, much bigger than this, with holes perforating it. What happens if you poured water into a, a bowl with holes in it? Sprays out everywhere, right? The picture was giving thanks to God for the rain which he poured out on our land to make our land fruitful. I've tried to explain to my kids, you know, a little bit about how God is involved in our lives. And I, I would hold up the, the bread at our, our table and I would go, you know where the bread comes from? And they go, yeah, Safeway. Maltby Babcock in the 17th century, 18th century, came up with a wonderful little prayer. I tried to get this into their heads. Um, behind the bread is the mill. Behind the mill is the grain. Behind the grain is the seed and the Lord who poured out the rain. Now, I don't know if this is exactly what was happening in that moment, but Jesus comes into the holy temple in the midst of this water-drawing ceremony, perhaps at least in the days when it's happening, that Hoshana Rabbah, and he announces to the crowd, to all who have ears to hear, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures say, from him streams of living water will flow from within that one. By this, he spoke of the Holy Spirit who was yet to be given into them. Our lives depend on water for our physical existence, but our spiritual lives depend on the Spirit of God who dwells within us and makes us fruitful. My brothers and sisters, we cannot fake love, joy, peace, patience. We can't fake goodness, kindness, faithfulness. We can't fake any of this. Oh, you can try. You can do it for a little while. But to see that embedded in your life over a period of time is what happens when a disciple is marinated in the waters of the Spirit of God and grows into that, that life. I can't be those things and I've given up pretending. I'm just grateful as I prayed coming here this morning that I didn't have to depend on scholarship or a good delivery. I had to depend upon the Spirit of God to talk to your heart and mine, even as we go through these and look at this, at this stuff. People knew there was something unusual about Jesus. As he walked out of the temple, having heard those words in John 8, he says, I am the light of the world, you're not going to live in darkness if you, if you know the Son, if you walk in His light. The disciples said in the opening verses of John, the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. John said, Jesus is the one who tabernacled among us in a, in a flimsy, some have called it an earth suit. God coming to dwell among us. The word skena means to not just dwell, but to tabernacle among us kind of a temporary dwelling place. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. I need to ask you, who is the we who saw the glory of God in Jesus? This isn't just theology. He's got, a, he's got a, an experience, a moment in mind. Who's the we? John, James, we call him Yaakov, and Peter, Shimon, Three Jewish guys on the side of a mountain, there with Yeshua, with Jesus. The glory of God descends upon him. They see his glory and they go, 
wow. And Peter gets so excited. He goes, Lord, let's build three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. I don't know how he knew they were Moses and Elijah. It's never explained. I they got name badges or something. But he knew. And he says, the Messiah has come, and it's time to build the tabernacle that we can dwell with you, O Lord. It is in the name of this Jesus that the glory of God is revealed. It is not the name I was looking for. I said to God, I, I want to know you. I'm asking, seeking, and knocking. Show me who you are and show me how I'm doing. He showed me part B first. He showed me I'm a sinner, I'm broken. Then he began to reveal himself to me in the person of Jesus. My first thought, forgive me, my first thought was, are you kidding me? I'm Jewish. Jews don't believe in Jesus. I will be your God, you will be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of you. And the key to experiencing that is the person of Jesus. There is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Many of us here this morning are part of a remnant from our own nation. I'm just a small remnant from my own nation. Kind of like the, the 7,000 that were set apart during the days of Elijah. But each one of you who are here, who's a follower of Jesus, is one of that remnant set aside by God to be his people, to dwell with him and him in you. God is doing some unusual things. I came to faith during a time when there was a, a, f a first wave in the Jewish community in modern times. Um, a whole wave of Jewish people were coming to faith in Jesus in the 1970s, apart from any other movement. In the 1990s, another wave broke out, and that was in the former Soviet Union, as Russian-speaking Jews, Ukrainian-speaking Jews were coming to faith in Jesus in massive numbers. Some of them have emigrated to Israel, some to the United States, some to Germany, where they're being welcomed back. Whole new era. And they're telling Germans, the God of reconciliation has come in the person of Jesus. And the enmity and the warfare and the sadness of this land can be healed as Jew and German find one another in Jesus Christ. We believe that the third wave, I'm not a prophet, okay? But we believe that the third wave may be on the verge of breaking out or happening in the state of Israel. As the name of Yeshua, the name of Jesus, is being lifted. This is a, a, a picture of, of some of our staff. We have an office in Tel Aviv. I lived with them for the first six months of this year, working on uh, developing a, a leadership team and, and a, um, discipling the, the younger team. They're lifting, <clears throat> sorry, they're lifting the name of, of Yeshua in a way that Israelis can hear. Um, long story behind the banner, but um, su suffice it to say, it's in the eyes of Israelis, there's a stark shock going on in that banner. Another time, maybe we had a Sunday school class sometime. But the phone number on the bottom, the star 5552, is uh, where people could call. And you see the guy on the, on the right side going, doing this. He's saying, just call. And they're out on the, the major highway, one of the major highways in Israel, and people are, are using their car phones to call the number. Up until this last week, we had over 8,500 contacts doing this and meeting people on the streets. I haven't got all the numbers yet, but do you know what the, how many people were, were contacted this, this campaign? The last, over the first few days, it was about 350 had given their name, address, email, and phone number for follow-up. And they get a, a copy of the Gospel of John in Hebrew, Russian, Amharic, or Arabic, because a lot of the Palestinians are asking for information about Jesus. You're not going to read about this in Fox, F, you know, MSNBC, the local papers. Behind the, the headlines, God is doing something really wonderful. This is a picture of our staff in Israel. As I said, we think it's um, um, a, third, a third wave that's breaking out there. Um, I love this group. Um, they're all Israeli citizens. If the government was ever to, to shut down evangelism, wouldn't change a thing. All these people are, are citizens of the state of Israel. There's, um, there's folks... From the, there are Russian speakers, all of them speak Hebrew now, but Russian speakers, um, folks have come in from uh, South Africa, India. Um, and the guy on the far left is, uh, is one of my favorites. If you think you have a hard job, that's Peter Nasser. He is an Israeli Arab from a village in the north who's come to work with Jews for Jesus because he's married to a Jewish believer. If you ever think you have a hard job, just imagine being an Arab telling Jews about Jesus the Messiah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, what does this mean? I don't know. But I do know from the, the book of Zechariah, there's a, a great hope about the future. We used to sing this as part of the liturgy in synagogue. Never knew a context for it, where it fit in. But this is a promise that in the days when the wars are ended in the Middle East, God yet has a plan. Then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. I'm not a prophet. I can only read the text, and it tells me a temple is going to be rebuilt. And after a massive war against our Jewish people, the survivors of that land and from around the world who are the remnant that love Jesus will come and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. From beginning to end, I said, from Genesis to Revelation. The book ends with this, this promise. Behold, the tabernacle of God is still going to be there. The tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. I will be your God. You will be my people. I will dwell in the midst of you. Don't miss this. If you're visiting this morning, if you don't know what this is all about, it's not about church. It's about a relationship with the living God and finding his forgiveness for our sin, repenting, and entering into the forgiveness that he accomplished for us at the cross of Calvary and welcomes us into his family so he can say, I'm going to make you fruitful and I want to dwell with you. Not inside a building, but inside of you. Don't miss this. We sang earlier, all hail his glory who died for me. Praise him who reigns forevermore. That's what this is all about, isn't it? After all, didn't the gospel of salvation start in a flimsy shelter outside of an inn? We'll get there. But first, I want you to have a joyous Thanksgiving celebration. And remember, ah, sorry. Where is it? He said, I, well, it's not going to show up. He said, I will be your God. Oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> you will be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of you. If you'd like to follow along with, with what we're doing, by the way, there's some, some uh, resource material at a, at a table. David will be back there. I'll try and be back there as well. If, um, if you wanted to know more about the ministry of Jews for Jesus, there was a card that was given to you. It looks like that. Um, fill it out. Leave it with me. I'll sit, make sure you get something about uh, all the feasts of Israel. But if you'd like to know what we're doing, both in Israel and here in the United States, just fill it out and leave it with David or me, and we'll see that uh, that's sent to you. Right now, I want to pray for you, all of you, and me too. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your, your heart to have united us as one in the body, for your grace and goodness to tell us you're our God. You want to dwell in the midst of us. And you're pleased that those who love you and know you are your people. And we're so thankful that it's your desire to make us fruitful as well. Dwell in our midst. Fill us with joy this Thanksgiving season. And for those who are on their way to knowing you, I pray that your spirit might move and energize them to respond to your great love with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.